The poor, of course, uh, rented in the downtown areas, and man, they were packed in like sardines. In New York City, there were 143 people an acre in the poor part of New York City in 1894. 143 people for an acre. A standard house today, by the way, is on a quarter acre lot. So we're talking about, about uh, what is that, about uh, 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 35 people living in one of those quarter acre lots. That was average. That's more dense than Tokyo is today. In the south, of course, blacks lived in crumbling slave quarters, uh, and, and they moved to the, to the cities, and they live in uh, uh, triple-deckers, three-story buildings, tenements, slums, row houses. Uh, at first, these were seen for gra as great improvements for the poor. Uh, we'll get them off the streets and get them into cheap housing. Uh, but the cheap housing turned out to be something of a catastrophe itself. Um, Tenements soon became a synonym for slum. They often lacked windows and heat and plumbing uh, and, and were uh, often in very terrible condition. And again, very small rooms packed with enormous amounts of people, as you can see from these pictures. America didn't really care or know much about this until uh, in 1890, a man named Jacob Reese would go around and take pictures of tenements. And he published a book called How the Other Half Lives. These are all images from that book. Um, you see, by the way, this alley here is the, the deadliest uh, uh, place, most dangerous place in America at the time. It was an alley where if you walked down, you were almost certainly going to be attacked uh, and mugged by, by uh, uh, thieves. Uh, reformers would often come in and declare the tenements to be terrible places to live and then tear them down. And they were terrible places to live. But they didn't replace them with anything. And so the tenements that existed just got more crowded and the people who lived there often would just end up homeless, which is even worse than the tenement. So while people began to recognize the problem, they didn't really do much effective to address it. Some more pictures from Jacob Rees of kids sleeping on the street. And here's a picture that, that uh, this is from... Uh, uh, a room that was called the nickel and night spot where you could pay a nickel and just sleep there and if you take a minute you can count how many people are in this picture um, it's more than you think uh, if, you, if you spend some time staring at that so transportation is key to all this because uh, you can't move out of the city unless you can get back into the city for your job horse-drawn streetcars uh, have been around since before the Civil War. If you look down here on the bottom of this picture on the left, you'll see horse-drawn streetcars. Uh, and those, those have been around for a long time. In the 1870s, New York builds an elevated railroad, and that's also in the picture on the left here. In fact, all three of these pictures are elevated railroads. But these are noisy, and they operate on steam, um, and, and, and they, they kind of make the city a little uh, worse, um, although transportation easier. New York, Chicago, and San Francisco will turn to cable cars. And, of course, uh, uh, San Francisco still uses cable cars. The first electric cable car, or trolley, is used in Richmond, Virginia, of all places, in 1888. But in 1897, Boston will develop... Oh, here are street cars. These are cable cars. In 1887, 1897, Boston will develop the first American subway. Um, uh, and, of course, New York will develop the, the most famous, the most iconic subway. But it actually starts in Boston. The Brooklyn Bridge will be another great accomplishment. This is, a, this is only possible with steel, this massive suspension bridge that is so iconic to America. At the time, it was considered to be one of the wonders of the world, and people would actually plan vacations uh, to come look at this thing. It was just simply uh, bigger than any other bridge that had ever been built, and of course it has a, a particular elegant beauty, I think. But it, it's worth understanding that this bridge is impossible without the mass production of steel. Another thing that steel made possible was skyscrapers. Um, in 1884, Chicago built a 10-story building. This was the first building to be called a skyscraper. It's up here on the top left. It's behind that Native American statue there. Uh, today, nobody would call that building a skyscraper, but at the time, a 10-story building was unheard of, and it was very impressive. Again, you have to have steel to get buildings very tall. Iron is simply not flexible enough, and when the wind starts blowing a tall building with iron, it's going to break. It won't work. It's the flexibility of a steel girder that makes this possible. Um, uh, the Otis elevator also helped too. A man named Otis invents an elevator, and so all of a sudden it, it's not such a hassle to get to the higher floors. Steel frame construction, by the way, also fireproof cities. When we turn away from wood to steel, it becomes much harder to burn an entire city down w with one fire, which we'll talk about later, uh, as opposed to a city built out of wood. The Chrysler Building will become the standard. That's there on the, uh, on the bottom uh, left. Uh, and then it will be passed, of course, by the Empire State Building, which will spend a long time as the tallest building in the world. Of course, it w it's been passed many, many, many times since then. Um, 